Tonight, we're going to take the last frame back to its very beginnings, and we're going to do a shoot breakdown. Three lights, one green gel, and one shoot through umbrella. Stay tuned. Hey gang, I am Joe Weddleman, and this is The Last Frame, the only live show that has a focus on the hows and whys behind making consistently great photographs. And for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to do my best to help you improve your photography by sharing some of my experience with you. If you're watching live, you know the drill. Please leave me a little note in the chat. Let me know you're here, where you're watching from. And if you're watching the replay, no worries. Please leave a comment below the video. It's always cool to see where photographers are tuning in from. Already, Cooley's here. Yes, Cooley, I gotta have that Coke, man. Uh, Robert from New Jersey. We got Alvin and Virginia gang. Thank you for tuning in. And thank you for being part of a growing global community of photographers in over 100 countries who tune in to watch The Last Frame every week. And of course, it would help a lot more people find out about The Last Frame. If you could do me a solid, hit that thumbs up below the video, down there, right, whoop, that, down there, there we go. The more thumbs up, the more YouTube will recommend the show to other photographers. And of course, while you're down there, feel free to go ahead and hit that share button to let your photography friends know that we are streaming live on YouTube right now. Twitter, Facebook, fastest way to get the word out. And of course, if you're a member of any photography clubs or groups, please let them know about the last frame. Don't keep it all to yourself. Photography is not a competition. It is a passion to be shared. So two quick reminders before we dive in. If you missed part two of my presentation, The Art of Creative Portraiture for the B&H event space that happened last week, you can still check it out. It's not too late. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share the link with you here in the chat for those of you here live. And also, you can find the link in the description below the video. So if you missed it, part two is there. You can also get the part one from that link. Tons of information. Hopefully you'll find some really useful stuff there. And for those of you that are working at or trying to make money with your photographer, uh, photography, excuse me, next week, Tuesday. So that's November 11th. That is going to be at 2 p.m. Eastern time in the United States. I'm going to be presenting a free webinar for PPA. PPA is the Professional Photographers of America. Again, this is a free webinar title, Effective Content Generation for Photographers. And just to read you the little description that is here, because it sums it up best, photographs are not content unless you add words. The problem is, honestly, I've yet to see or meet a photographer who went into business taking pictures because they enjoy writing social media posts or writing blog posts or website pages. And of course, the dreaded about me page. So in this webinar, I'm going to share with you some simple techniques that will help you generate effective and interesting content that will connect with your customers and your potential customers. And we're going to do all that without breaking the bank. You're not going to have to spend tons of money on all kinds of utilities. I'm going to share some really good ones, but you can do it without them. So again, that's next Tuesday. You can get to the sign-up page through that link that I just shared uh, in the chat. Again, also in the description below the video if you're not here live. No worries. Check it out. I hope to see you there, especially if you're trying to up your business game, right? Okay. So we're going we're gonna to take a step back. And full disclosure, gang. The very, very first video, actually very first several videos that I did that were titled The Last Frame, probably about five, six years ago, and they were shot breakdowns, similar to what I'm going to do tonight live. The ones that I did back then, they weren't live, but they were at the time an experiment with me putting out a second video every week, which was just ridiculous. Uh, I was recording them in about a day, usually on the weekend, and basically taking an image and walking you through how I did it. 
all my choices, some lighting diagrams, behind the scenes images, if I had them, all that kind of stuff. So you know that I'm a big one if you follow me and if you've been here before, you know that I'm a big one for experimenting with the format and seeing where we can take it and also making sure that I can provide you content that's got some value while still being able to keep up with the workload that I have for other aspects of my photography career that pay the bills, right? So I thought I'm going to try and take it back to the beginning. And now that I have some really cool software, the Satellite 3D, and some other utilities that I didn't have when I started that concept, see if we can't maybe make this a weekly thing and see if I can provide some value to you folks by basically walking you through these various photo shot or photo shoots that I've done, or at least pieces of photo shoots. But again, it's not for me to brag about pictures. In fact, I want to make it a point to not always show really, really cool fashion and beauty shots. I want to do some simpler shots, the kinds of shots that a lot of you are probably trying to do if you're photographing models for the first time, or maybe you're you know, working on modeling portfolios and things that will hopefully be able to help you up your game. But regardless, I'm going to walk you through the thought process, the decision-making process behind how I did the shots. So this particular series of images that I'm going to show you tonight, and there are uh, three of them, okay? The first two are this full-length shot, this close-up shot, and then, whoops, that's the behind-the-scenes one. We're going to go to that one here, this close-up shot here, okay? These three pictures were taken for uh, just a basic modeling portfolio shoot. Nothing super important, nothing super fancy. So to give you backstory and decisions, okay? These shots were done in the basement of the building that housed the studio that I had been leasing prior to COVID taking over the world. If you remember, I had that big natural light studio with the north facing windows and I had um, done one shoot with this young lady. She was back for a second day at my invitation. She was great in front of the camera. And this was not an outfit that I had planned for. She brought it along and it was nice in terms of the color, but also kind of boring in terms of, well, I mean, it's just a pretty dress. It's cute, but there's nothing like super, super, super fancy about it. So... I wanted to see what I could do with this. And I remembered that in the basement of the building, and this particular building is um, an old cigar factory that has been converted into artist lofts. And they actually have uh, concerts and performances in the basement of the building, kind of like raves. And entire sections of the basement are just painted with graffiti like you see here. So here you can kind of get a sense of where this image was, was being shot, right? So it's basically, you know, a graffiti filled room. And I remembered that one of the walls had this blue green set of patterns. And I thought, you know what? I could do something interesting with that. Not my normal thing. We weren't doing crazy makeup, crazy hair, nothing like that. I wanted to do kind of just a simple modeling shot, but with super clean light. So just to kind of drive the point home, because I talk about this so much, I wound up working with three lights, but they're basically simple lights. Godox 8200s are the lights. So we're talking 200 watt second flashes. All three of them have Fresnel heads on them, right? So that's like the speed light head. I'm not doing, you know, any bare bulb, no seven inch reflector stuff, none of that, right? And for the sake of a modifier, especially in a space like this, I went with my shoot through umbrella. Now, why would I pick a shoot through? Because my studio was, you know, up two flights of stairs. So I, I could have brought any modifier that I wanted. Why would I pick the shoot through for this space instead of working with maybe like my 26 centimeter, um, you know, collapsible beauty dish or Octobox or something like that? The reason was I intentionally wanted to throw some light around the room, but not have it light the room evenly. So remember, 
if you're working with a soft box or you know a beauty dish or an octobox or anything like that, it's going to focus the light a little bit more. It reduces the spread and makes your light a little bit more directional, right? So what ultimately happens then is I would need to use a little bit more light to light kind of the whole area because the light that I would be using for my subject, if I was using a soft box or an octobox, would not have had really any impact on the background at all. So what I've done here is I've purposely pulled my light a good eight to 10 feet away from my subject, right? So that inverse square law, the light doesn't fall off too rapidly after. In fact, you'll notice she's being lit, but you'll see that there's no shadow behind her at all. None, like not even, not even just a hint of a shadow. And in part, that's because there's a light over here on camera, right? That's tucked out of the way that um, has a green gel on it. But I would still get a little bit of shadow if I was really kind of overlighting her compared to the surrounding space, right? So here you see the setup. The ceiling is a very high ceiling with like these wooden rafters. So it's not really contributing anything, um, you know, to the room light there. You can see kind of up into the ceiling. It's, it's not adding anything to um, what I got going on there. But again, you can still see, you know, from the floor, there is no shadow behind her. So I'm really basically working with the idea that I'm getting that light to her face. And then there's going to be a little bit of extra fill that goes around the room, right? And I'm going to show you software version of that momentarily. So by making sure also, and this is super important, big mistake, rookie mistake that I'll see a lot of photographers make is they'll set something like this up, like this up, because this looks like really simple, right? It is a simple, basic lighting setup. They'll set something like this up and the very next thing they'll do is they'll have the model posed looking towards the key light and then the model turns this way and they're like, yeah, go for it, cool. And suddenly what they're not paying attention to is that the lighting on the model's face is horrible. So that's why you know I wanna show you, as you look at these shots, there's the light from that setup. Now, some of the little kind of tip-offs here if the umbrella was closer, normally in a studio setting, we're not in a studio, but in a studio setting, if I was doing a headshot or a portrait with the umbrella, I would probably have the front of my umbrella three and a half to four feet, maybe even three feet from my subject's face. The shadow that you see under her chin would be even softer. And the shadows, the hints of the shadows from her curls would be almost non-existent. Because I've backed the light up a little bit more, the light has taken on a little bit more directionality and sharpness. And that's why I'm actually seeing the hint of shadows there, which honestly don't bother me. Now that I've pointed out to you, them to you, maybe you can't not see them and maybe they bother you. And if they do, that's okay. You won't do it this way, but they don't bother me at all. Um, but even having a little bit of the fine shadow here gives me a little bit of shape to her jawline, creates a little bit of definition. And then, you know, in the full length picture, you see similarly. But I also want you to notice from the light that I have placed on camera right, the one that is over here, tucked out of the way, okay? Not only am I getting a little bit of green rim, but I'm also getting just a hint of the green on the jawline. If she starts to turn her face back anymore, I start to light up her face. Now, is she posed in the sense that I'm telling her, don't move? No, not at all, okay? In fact, this young lady was very comfortable in front of the camera and she actually liked to move. So I was kind of trying to almost contain her a little bit in the sense that I told her like, look, whatever you do, I need your face to be towards that umbrella. So your nose has gotta be in the direction of that umbrella. And then you're just gonna look at me and we're gonna go from there and she didn't, awesome job at that. So I didn't have a whole lot of managing to do, but it's very, very important that I kept her face towards the umbrella. Okay. Um, so finished results on those two shots there. Again, background, I'm going to show you the, the uh, 3D diagram here in a second so that you get a sense of, whoops, excuse me, how it was set up. There we go. Now, if I switch over to my second display, all right, 
So I, I've done kind of the, the 3D rendering software here. In fact, I want to back this up a little bit. I had moved it in. So just to kind of give you uh, a sense of the scenario that I'm working with here, number one, you'll see that I've got the umbrella a little bit higher than I normally would have it for a portrait session. Um, in part because I've backed that umbrella up and I'm giving the light time to spread so that she's lit pretty evenly. Because again, if we go back to, um, sorry, let me just go back to the shot here really quick and show you now that I did that. Um, you'll notice it's not like the bottom of the shot is way dark and you can't see any detail. I still have detail in the dress down at the bottom. So the whole point there was, let's go to the other full length shot, okay? You can see detail and texture in the dress at the bottom. You can still see her foot. Her foot's not pitch black. Certainly, you can see her skin tone has dropped off in part because her foot's under the dress. But the point is, by backing that light up, I'm able to light this full length picture. And this girl, if I remember correctly, is about five foot six. So she's not super short, but she's not super tall, okay? But I'm able to light this full length picture with that one umbrella. My key light is one umbrella that's lighting all of her. Okay. So we'll go back to the software here. Uh, so again, from a height standpoint, you can see the light's fairly high. The light with the green gel tucked into the corner. And there is a third light. I mentioned in the, the cover art for tonight, there's three lights. Okay. The third light is basically behind her just to put a little bit of glow on the wall. And I'll go back to the browser again in a second and I'll show you the three images. But essentially that's that's kind of the setup that we were working with there. And again, I wanna go back and I'll show you the glow on the wall, okay? You notice how it's a little bit brighter in the center behind her. And that's just a light on a small stand that, uh, and it's a short background stand. So it's one of the ones that doesn't have really long legs. The legs are really thin. She's got a long dress. The dress is hiding it. I didn't retouch the, the stand legs out of the shot. Okay. Um, so it's set at about uh, waist level and it's aimed at the background. Lawrence, as I mentioned early on, all three lights are Godox 8200s with the Fresnel heads on them. Okay. Uh, whoops, let's get the one where you can actually see it. That's a Godox 8200. That little wing that you see on it there is a MagMod uh, grip that's sitting there. Obviously, I don't have any gels on that one, but that's what that is. It's a MagMod grip that's sitting on there. That's maybe why the front looks a little bit weird, but that's a Godox 8200 with um, a Fresnel head on the front. So it's 200 watt seconds, Lawrence. Uh, not super powerful. Uh, again, guys, I, I want to be really clear and you're going to hear me talk a lot more about this over the next couple of weeks. In fact, next week, especially, um, I've got a really, really cool picture that I'm going to do a breakdown from. And I, I can't show it. Well, I'm going to show you the picture tonight, but I can't, I can't tell you much about it tonight. After tomorrow, I can tell you more about it. But next week, when I do the breakdown, um, I will reiterate what I'm about to say. And that is that you hear me talk all the time. You hear me kind of poke at people that, you know, have these Godox 80, 600 strobes, you know, all this, these super huge, super powerful strobes. And routinely in our Facebook group, you see people, you know, posting images and mentioning, I couldn't get the light far enough away. I had it turned all the way down. And the problem they're working with is they're working with a 600 watt second light. It's just too much power. Um, so I rarely, and I mean extremely rarely find myself using more than 200 watt seconds. And now that I'm working predominantly with LED lighting, I'm working with even less power than that, right? Because the LED lights don't match up to 200 watt seconds. They're, they're somewhat less powerful than that. So, so yeah, so that's basically um, what we're dealing with there. Now, as I also always talk about, I always talk about the idea of, work your shot. Okay. So the setup for this was let's do the full length picture. Important to point out, I want you to notice I'm not shooting at eye level for the full length picture. If you look closely at the image, you can figure out my camera is pretty much at her belly button, right? What that means is that 
the camera and the model are parallel to each other. So there's no distortion happening, right? If I would have stood up, so I'm 5'8". I'm not that tall, but I'm still about two inches taller than her. So that means that if I would have stood up, I would have had to tilt my camera down to get all of her body in. That would have created distortion in the proportions of her body. If I got low to the ground and shot up, I would have created distortion by ex you know, extending the body, making it look longer, not always in the right proportions. So for simple, you know, full length, straight on shot, middle of the body, that's the camera height that I want to be at. That way, my sensor and my subject are parallel. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's important to note that. Then for the close-up shot, again, work the shot. Try different things, get different things. Same lighting, same exposure, no changes other than me standing up and walking closer. Right? That's all it is. Now I am not shooting from the middle of her body, but I am shooting below her eyes, so I'm looking up slightly at her. Uh, Cooley, what is the highest f-stop you can get with LED light? What's the highest f-stop on your lens? F22? I can shoot at f22. I'm either going to work at a higher ISO or I'm going to work at a slower shutter speed, but you know, uh, the lens on these guys was a 45 millimeter lens. Also, I want to, I want to just let you guys know if you would like to see it's, I know it's always hard on YouTube when you're watching a video. So I got a little treat for you and I'm going to do this every week when we do this feature. If you go and you visit my Flickr profile, I'm going to put the link in here. Okay. You can see the images at full res and all of the tech specs are there. Everything is there in terms of how it was shot. Okay. So I put the behind the scenes images in and I put the finished images in. So that way you can actually go and check them out. Right. So I did the first two shots, um, the full length shot. Then I did the close up. So then over on the right side of the room, as you can see, is these boards that were just leaning up against another wall, right? And so it's like, okay, let me see if I can, you know, put this to use. So I went ahead and did this shot, which is my least favorite of the three. The reason why this is my least favorite of three, it kind of reminds me of like how they used to do like glamour portraits, like back in, you know, the 1970s and 80s. It's like, you know, leaning against the wall. So that was Joe ultimately making a cheesy shot that I didn't like. But what's important is I tried several different scenarios looking for opportunities that might be interesting. I mean, the picture's not horrible. Don't get me wrong. It's just, it's just kind of a really old school glamour post. But here's a couple things that I want to show you that are super important just so that you're aware of this and so that you consider this if you ever do something like this, right? Look at the placement of her arms and her hands. The arm that is closest to the camera is purposely down. A lot of people, if you tell them just do the wall thing, you know, they come in and it's like this on the wall here. Let me back up. Okay, it's like that on the wall. And then the front arm is like covering their whole body, right? So bottom arm is lower top arm is higher, creates, you know, the staggering effect. Okay. I'm not a big fan. Uh, honestly, whoops, here it is. I'm not a big fan of the way I turned her hand. Unfortunately, that's on me. Right. Um, but this was my third option, but here's the important pieces also. So number one, posing tip, if you're going to do the profile thing, drop the, the front arm so it doesn't cover the whole body. Right. The other piece is I want you to notice the wall that she's leaning against. And then of course the background, let me go to the behind the scenes shot. So now this is still a three light setup. She, so she's right at the edge. I've used uh, on, on this particular one. Now this is different. Unfortunately, it's a slightly different lighting scenario here. You can see that the rim light is over on camera left, right? And here in this one, which I didn't, I didn't process a big one of this, but you can see I still had the rim light back behind the board and I absolutely did not like the green. But here's the challenge. Look how far away I still have the umbrella from the board and there's a reason for that, right? So again, let's switch back to the software. I am going to load, um, let's see, I'm gonna load another version of this, 
Okay. So here's basically the setup that I just showed you. I've got my rim light over on camera left behind her to get the, the green highlighting and the green fill on the hair that you see up above me there. Okay. And the umbrella off to the side here, not super close. The thing that you have to pay attention to when you do a lighting setup like this, where you're gonna kind of shoot down that wall, you have to pay attention to the idea that if you bring, in fact, here, let me let me back the camera up a little bit more so we see a little more wall, okay? And we're gonna do this from the side so that you can see where I have the light, but then also see the result up above me, okay? if I bring this in too close. It's easy to get to a point. See how the wall is starting to get brighter than her. You don't really want that because your subject should be the key focal point. That's where you want all the attention. So I'm purposely, just like I did in the first shot, backing the light up a little bit because that way it's almost kind of like creating a bit of a triangle where I've got almost equal space coming from the umbrella here, subject to the umbrella, as umbrella to the wall. In fact, if I want either one of them to be less than the other, I want the umbrella to the wall to be, or excuse me, greater than the other. I want the umbrella to the wall to be a greater distance than the umbrella to the face. That way, I'm not gonna overlight the wall. If I were to bring this closer, See how that wall starts to light up, okay? And even if, you know, I'm gonna back it up so she's properly exposed. Now you see how on camera right, the wall is brighter than her. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to find the sweet spot because at the same time, pay close attention up above me. If I move this light over too far, see how we start to get like too much shadowing on her face, right? So I still have to bring it out in front, but that's why I'm backing it up a little bit so that I can even things out and not have the high, I kind of lost my starting spot, starting part net point now, but I want to be able to still light her face evenly. There we go. And not have the wall too bright. So I'm showing you these things, number one, just so that you get a sense of like, this is the kind of detail. And these are the things that you need to be paying attention to when you're doing shots like this. One of the things that I routinely see happening, and look, I get it because I did it. I went through this part of the learning curve and that is when you're first starting, you know, you set up a light and your subject is kind of sitting there and just kind of hanging out, right? And you do your test shots and you get your exposure done and everything looks fine. And then because you, the photographer, aren't super confident with model, with posing, you say to the subject, okay, go. And the subject's into it. She's like, she's here and she's here and she's here. and She's all over the place. But that means like a third to 40% of your shots, she's looking in the wrong direction. And then your lighting is not that good. That's the problem, right? Dante's uh, question may be basic. That's okay. Did I use a gray card? How uh, the temp and tint was set in post-processing light may be crazy considering wall. Okay, cool. So number one, did I use a gray card? No. Number two, your thought process about the light being crazy because of the walls, it would still be crazy even with the gray card. So the gray card doesn't fix that problem. If you're getting kickback of a color, you're getting a kickback with or without the gray card and with or without correcting it for the gray card, right? Because when you use your eyedropper in the gray card, it's gonna fix the gray card, but the kickback still exists. So it, it doesn't take that out of the shot, right? Um, so there's a couple things, that, and, but here's why it's a great question because there's some information that I can add to this that I think will help solve your problem. So there's a couple things at play here. Number one, these boards aren't shiny. Number two, I'm not aiming the light directly at them. Number three, remember what I've just been talking about, I'm making sure that the wall is not brighter than my subject. If the wall were brighter than my subject, I definitely would get light kicking back onto the subject, okay? And you can see in the finished shot here, you know, I don't have any problem with light, even in shadow areas. I don't have green or reds or blues kicking into there. There's no fancy trick post-processing, right? It's simply that my subject is easily uh, a half a stop to a stop brighter than the wall. So I'm not getting that kickback. But here's another thing that's very, very helpful in this situation, right? 
for shots like this, like this one, this one, you know, even the, the wide shots like this, auto white balance, you'd stand better chances of winning a roulette game in a casino, right? And that's any camera. You know, cameras today are amazing with auto white balance, but look at all these colors and then you've got the skin tone. So if you were going to live on auto white balance, then I would say you need to use a gray card. The easiest solution is, I know, because I read the instruction manual, that the white balance of my Godox 80 200s is 5,600K. So all I have to do is set my camera's white balance to 5,600K. And now my camera's white balance matches my flash, boom. And as long as I don't overlight one of those walls, I'm not going to get kickback on my subject's face, right? So not a basic question. It's actually a great question. And my hunch is you've probably asked that question because you've probably done something where you got kicked back. And believe me, I've done that too many, many times. It's one of those hard lessons to learn. And the lesson simply is, gang, pay attention to exposure, right? Pay attention. If you get your exposure right, you eliminate a lot of those problems where, you know, light is causing color issues and all that kind of stuff. But that's the key. Got to get the exposure right and get it consistent. And the way you're doing that, folks, slow down. It, it's literally just slow down. This was a situation actually doing this shot. I did not have the opportunity to set it up in advance. I walked into the space with the model and a makeup artist for the very first time and said, Ooh, this would look cool. Let's do this. Okay. Um, it still took me 15 minutes to set that up. That's a really basic setup. I spent 15 minutes setting it up and testing it. And I just let the model talk to the makeup artist and, and hang out for a few minutes. And I talked to them as well, but I did not rush right? Because it's when you rush, that's when you run into problems. Okay. All right, gang, listen, I hope that you found this helpful. If you did, let me know in the comments, right? Because I'm really liking the idea of doing this and kind of going through very different scenarios each week and showing you some good stuff and showing you some stuff that just was like, yeah, but really giving you insight into what the thought process was, why I made the choices I made, how I solve problems like this. And you guys had some great questions tonight. So thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. And if you do have a specific topic or a question that you would like me to talk about in an upcoming episode of The Last Frame, leave it in the comments below the videos, right? Uh, understand that questions that are detailed have a lot more info, stand a better chance of being selected than you know the short open-ended question, right? Coolly, that location was actually in the basement of the building where my studio was, the studio that I had prior to um, the pandemic happening. So it um, was kind of one of those locations that was just demanding that I had to shoot in it at some point, okay? All right, gang, listen, have a great week. Stay safe. Go pick up that camera and shoot something because your best shot, you know the drill. It's your next shot. Adios, gang.